Hello, I'm Jo Marie Fredericks. I'm currently serving as the 2023 president of the International Trademark Association. Welcome. You're listening to IP Fridays. Hello, and welcome to this episode of IP Fridays. Our names are Ken Suzanne and Rolf Clayson, and this is the podcast dedicated to intellectual property. It does not matter where you are from, in-house or private practice, novice or expert. We will help you stay up to date with current topics in the fields of trademarks, patents, design and copyright, discover useful tools, and much more. Welcome to episode 139 of IP Fridays. My co-host Ken Suzanne and I will attend the INTA annual meeting this year from May 16 to May 20 in Singapore. So if you want to meet us, make sure you register and join us in Singapore. The 2023 INTA annual meeting is probably the most important meeting in the IP world since more than 10,000 people will be attending this meeting. Not only trademark professionals, but also patent professionals and design professionals and all sorts of professionals in the IP field. Today's interview guest is no less than INTA President Jo Marie Fredericks. But before we jump into the interview, I have news for you. The European Patent Office has issued the decision of the Enlarged Board of Appeal G2 of 21. It acknowledges different thresholds for inventive step and enablement with regard to post-filing data. In this landmark decision, the Enlarged Board of Appeal of the European Patent Office has put a stop to the trends in case law that have rendered it increasingly difficult for applicants and patentees to submit post-filing data as evidence of an inventive step over the last decade. If you'll want to learn more about this, I have posted an article on my LinkedIn profile where you can read more about this decision. Also, a Board of Appeal of the European Patent Office finds that video conferencing is now equivalent to in-person proceedings and that the gold standards of the Enlarged Board of Appeal decision G1 in 21 no longer applies. Also, the Boards of Appeal of the European Patent Office have published their yearly review of the case law and in this case of the case law of 2022. So if you are interested, head over to epo.org and download the latest summary of the case law of the last year. Now let's jump into the interview with INTA President Jo Marie Fredericks. Today's guest is Jo Marie Fredericks. If you don't know Jo Marie, she is currently serving as the INTA President, the International Trademark Association President. And she's also Deputy General Counsel and Chief Intellectual Property and Brand Counsel of Rotary International, and also serving as a member on the Trademark Public Advisory Committee of the USPTO. Thank you for being on the show, Jo Marie. Thank you so much for having me. All right. I'm very happy that you uh, have time, especially before the INTA annual meeting starts. And I first, I wanted to ask you how did you decide to become the president of INTA or how did that come about? You, you're already obviously a longtime member of INTA. Um, so, but uh, how did that work out? <laughs> well, thank you for the question. You know, I didn't really decide to become um, president. I, I decided to accept the nomination, but my peers and my colleagues in the INTA staff were all really supportive in, um, in, sort of bringing along my INTA career, if you will, and nominating me for this position and for positions that came before it. So I started uh, I started my volunteer work with INTA with the support of Rotary International. I mean, you know, if my employer hadn't been behind this, I never would have been able to be as active a participant in INTA as I am. But as a global brand owner, once I went to work for Rotary International, one of my first... Um, my first concerns, I wanted Rotary International to join INTA. I felt that it was to truly have a seat at the table uh, in the global trademark community, 
you need to be a member of INTA. And so we joined shortly after I started working there and I got more and more involved as the years went on. And it started after a year or two, I joined a committee and then I served on another committee and another one. And I eventually uh, started serving on the in-house practitioners committee, which I, I served on a number of others and they were all great experiences. Um, but my I heart, I think, was with the in-house practitioners committee because I am an in-house practitioner. And I loved all of the resources that the committee was able to provide for in-house members. Um, and, and it's called in-house practitioners, not in-house counsel, because it embraces uh, lawyers, paralegals, all, all legal professionals that are that are in-house. And so I stayed with that committee, I think, longer than I was welcome, probably, because after I maxed out my committee terms, then I stayed on as vice chair, and then I did yet another term as chair. And at that point, I was already sitting on the INTA board. And so one thing just led to another. And I did uh, my first stint on the INTA board of directors from 2014 to 2016. And then I rotated off and I was co-chair of the Barcelona annual meeting in 2017. And then they brought me back on the board on the officer track starting in 2018. So the officer track is... It's, I think, six years. So you do, uh, and it, there's an order to it. And not everybody does the entire track, but for me, that's how it worked out. So I was secretary and then treasurer and then vice president and then vice president again, but in a different role. There's two vice president roles and then president elect. And now this year I'm president. Wow. Congratulations. Thank so you. very exciting. Uh, INTA can bring about good things. So um, just before recording this interview, we uh, talked about how this podcast actually started. And that was also during the 2014 Hong Kong INTA meeting, um, where my co-host Ken Suzen and me were thinking about starting this podcast. And so we recorded lots of interviews with all the interesting people at the INTA and your meeting. And then, yeah, we started this podcast. So I'm very grateful for for INTA and for, for this platform uh, of the annual meeting where all these very interesting people can meet and exchange knowledge, ideas, and help. And uh, yes. I'm um, very grateful for INTA as well. It has shaped my career and my professional as well as personal life in ways that I never could have envisioned. Through INTA, I've met people from all over the world, some of which I now call friends. And once you meet you know, my foreign council, I now can work with them in person. I would meet with them at INTA meetings, wherever the annual meeting or the leadership meeting was going to be. And it's amazing how much faster you can uh, settle something in person rather than through a million emails or even a telephone call. Yes. We don't do a lot of telephone calls these days, but I've been around long enough where we, we did things by telephone call. But with time changes, it's difficult. And at an INTA meeting, meeting it's just the perfect opportunity to meet people in person and to, uh, you know, network, of course, but also to meet people that you already know and to work through current cases. And uh, it just expand my network. It, it's been it has changed my career in unimaginable ways. It's been great. Yes, I completely agree. And I have not experienced it to the level that you have experienced in it, of course. <laughs> so thank you very much for explaining how how good INTA is for, for all the people listening here, for all the IP community, basically, not only trademark professionals. I meet all the different kinds of professionals, like patent professionals and INTA annual meetings and design right. professionals and and unfair competition professionals and copyright professionals, they all gather there. So it's, a, it's very not really, uh, it's officially the trademark annual meeting, but um, yeah, all the professions meet there basically. <laughs> so before we, um, oh, actually, I want to um, dive into um, the topics that you have, uh, that you want to address in this year of your presidency. And uh, you have a motto uh, saying unlocking IP. So explain what you mean by unlocking IP. Right. So unlocking IP is the title of my presidential task force. We are actually still in the process of setting up the task force. <clears throat> Invite letters are going out this week to members of the task force. We have a preliminary outline for what it hopes to accomplish. But I hope that by the time this airs, 
we will be up and running. So this might be a little out of date by then, but I can tell you what we hope to accomplish. So unlocking IP, the idea is that we want to increase IP awareness and understanding among consumers. We think it can and should be better. And so we'd like to, quote unquote, unlock IP to make it more accessible to everyone. Why should consumers care about IP? I think a lot of consumers just see it as big business, big brands, and a way to make money. <clears throat> and sure, there is some of that. You're protecting a brand. You are selling products. If you're a consumer products company, my company is not, but we still certainly protect our brands. But there's also an emotional aspect. There's a shortcut aspect to IP, if you will. If you go to a grocery store and there's an entire shelf of products, you may be drawn to the one with a name that you recognize or a logo that you recognize. Or if it's a product that you're not familiar with, maybe you recognize the company that produces it, the brand name, if not the actual name of the product. And you go to that because you know you can rely on it. And of course, the whole reason for trademarks existing in most countries' laws is as a source protector, so a source indicator, rather, to protect the public. And so I think if consumers realize that trademarks are there for them, for their protection, for their ease, I think they might care about them a little more. But in order to do that, we have to explain them better, make them more accessible. And so the idea is that we would begin with the media. And through the media, we hope to ultimately reach consumers. So the media has the first and best access to consumers. So through the task force, we're looking to provide tools to allow the media to communicate more effectively on IP issues. Many media are very, very knowledgeable about IP. And many aren't. You can't be an expert on everything. And you may be called to do a story on IP. Maybe it's something you've done before. Maybe you think it's interesting. Maybe you've never done one before and don't think it's interesting. And it would be great to have resources that INTA can provide that easily might explain the differences between patent and copyright and trademark. Might have some basic language that you could start with when you're explaining about IP and IP protection to the public. And so having some of these tools available might just make it easier for the media as they're communicating about um, IP issues. And so the aim of the tools is to benefit the media, increase their awareness so that they will ultimately better educate the public and raise consumer awareness. And then there's uh, a, a few other aspects that we're going to leave it to the task force, how to best approach. But we also want to look at small and medium enterprise enterprises, SMEs, if you will. Mm -hmm. When you're starting a company, I think most startups know to talk to a lawyer, maybe to incorporate, to get certain legal things in place, but they don't necessarily com consider IP to be part of the first tier. Some of them don't understand how necessary it is. Some do understand, but they think, well, I can't really afford that expense right now. I'll do that later. Well, later could end up costing them more money. If it's a name or a logo that somebody else owns, you might either have to pay money because you're infringing someone's mark. You may be forced to change a mark, which costs money. And you may have also, at that point, established some type of reputation among the consuming public and then you have to change your mark. So it can cost you a lot in terms of time, money, resources down the road. So we think elevating IP to the first tier could actually be a time saver and a cost saver to SMEs. So we'd like to do some education around that. And one of the ways we thought we could do it <clears throat> is perhaps looking at educational programs globally. So in many paralegal programs, there isn't a course in IP. Some have it, some don't. But if every paralegal program were to have one class in IP, then there would be basic understanding as these paralegals went out into the various industries and law firms and started working on these issues. Similarly, if every MBA program had a course in IP, if every university um, program in pre-law had a course in IP, we would be increasing the outreach, right? 
Another way is if we were to bring in the PR and the uh, marketing people at all of our companies and educate them better about IP and have them understand the priority that it is, they have a first line to the media. You know, we spend a lot of time as trademark lawyers or IP practitioners talking to each other, and we all agree how important it is. But when you go to outside of us, our little community, our bubble, it doesn't necessarily get the same treatment. And so if we can educate and bring in the PR and the marketing people, we would increase our outreach hundreds fold. And so these are some of the things that the task force will be looking at doing, how best to do this. And it may not all get done in the first year. We hope hope certainly um, creating some tools for use of the media will be done um, by the end of this year, certainly early next. But these other issues are ongoing concerns, and the task force may come up with some ways to best do this as ongoing efforts. So we don't know what that's going to look like yet, but these are all part of the ideas that the task force is going to be looking at. Yes, um, that's a very, very good point, educating people more about IP. Um, I see that as a very, very important, more important point than even maybe five years ago because of all the misinformation that is all, um, happening in social media and so on. Um, I myself, I was also teaching uh, IP at a college here just uh, because of uh, exactly that reason, because it's important to teach people about IP, especially Uh, as you mentioned, like business administration or other um, not IP um, curricula to, to introduce courses about IP that's, uh, and paralegals, that's really an excellent idea. Yes, I, I will immediately try to transfer this idea to our German education, paralegal education system. That's really a very good point. Thank you um, so much. I can't take credit for that idea. It was the idea of one of my colleagues who is a paralegal, and it just made so much sense. Yes. I've, I've sort perfect. of appropriated it for the task force. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Um, so that was that is a very important point, uh, um, educating the public more about the benefits of IP and how uh, how that can be important for the for the normal consumer. Um, you have some other topics on your wish list for uh, to <laughs> to get done for this year or to to address this year, um, and one stuck out to me um, is harmonization of IP regulations across r jurisdictions. Um, so harmonization is an ongoing effort for for decades probably. Um, yes. But wh wh where do you see the most important? Um, need to need for action uh, to to get something harmonized. What what would you love to get harmonized first? Let's say. Right. Well, as you pointed out, many of these are ongoing things. They're not necessarily new ideas to me. Educating the consumers, raising awareness of IP in the public. That's not a new idea. It's something that we've all struggled with for years. Hopefully moving some focus to it through my presidential task force can can start to move the bar just a little, but it's not, it's not going to be done. Same thing with harmonization um, of IP regulations across jurisdictions. This is part of INTA's advocacy effort and activities. INTA has worked toward harmonization of IP regulations for a long time. We will continue to do so well beyond my, my presidential year, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a concern and it's been a focus. Strong laws and enforcement enforcement procedures are particularly effective if they're harmonized across jurisdictions so that trademark owners are less burdened with variations that can cause uncertainties, confusion, violations of local laws, regulation that they could just be faced unaware. Harmonization also provides greater cross-border protections for consumers in an increasingly globalized marketplace. Yes. So, um, yeah, so there are so many Uh, so many things that are regulated differently in a different jurisdictions. Uh, just um, talking about, let's say, the need to use trademarks <laughs> is very different in different uh, jurisdictions, uh, the US and uh, Europe, for example. Uh, and I see um, a big need to harmonize um, these things. And I'm glad to see that you are addressing this in your year of presidency as well. So are there any favorite topics that you also want to talk about that you want to address this year? 
Well, you know, I, I think I can talk about some other of INTA's advocacy um, efforts that I are going to progress hopefully this year. And the first that comes to mind really is brand restrictions. And I think um, that was something that you had indicated you wanted to talk about a little bit as well. Um, and so, you know, brand restrictions, this is an important topic for INTA and for the global uh trademark community. So restrictions on the use of brands include mandate, and, and you know this, but you know, for the benefit of your listeners who probably know most of it as, as well, um, but restrictions on the use of brands include mandatory plain packaging, standardized packaging, and the elimination or reduction of the use of characters, logos, designs, devices, basically trademarks on packaging. So all such restrictions have a negative impact on the brand owner's ability to communicate with consumers. They also result in lost tax revenue and jobs and undermine consumers' confidence in trademarks. It's one of the greatest threats to brands and IP today. More and more governments are considering brand restrictions to address health and social issues. And it hinders what is perhaps the most critical way that brands communicate with consumers. In essence, it, does, it diminishes consumer trust. So trademarks specifically communicate and enforce this trust. Brand restrictions and the removal of trademarks from branded products will only degrade consumers' trust in brands. So as you know, globally, this trend began with tobacco products. First in Australia with the Tobacco Plain Packaging Act in 2011, and then followed a few years later by France and the United Kingdom and by Singapore in 2018. So numerous industries and product categories beyond tobacco are now at risk. So I think it's easy to look at it, but, oh, that's just tobacco. But it's many, many, many other things at this point. So to date, INTA has filed submissions with governments on brand restrictions in over 20 jurisdictions across Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas. Um, so one other topic that I wanted to talk with you um, about is anti-counterfeiting, because that's also something that uh, bothers me uh, or, or gets me busy. <laughs> But um, that's an important topic also among a lot of uh, trademark professionals. So maybe um, talk about that, what, what you want to do uh, about anti-counterfeiting in your year of the presidency in, in this year. Right. So thank you for raising it because anti-counterfeiting is such a big global concern. And it's been a mad, major uh, advocacy issue for INTA, uh, where they're putting a lot of their advocacy efforts for many years, especially through its anti-counterfeiting committee, or we call it the ACC. So through the ACC, INTA partners with stakeholders to advocate for stronger anti-counterfeiting measures online and offline, to promote cooperation in enforcement efforts across agencies and borders, and to increase awareness of the harms of counterfeiting. The ACC is the largest of all of INTA's 37 committees. It is truly global. It's got 290 member volunteers in 71 countries. So it's enormous. And what does it do? Well, a lot of things. It evaluates treaties, laws, and regulations related to anti-counterfeiting and enforcement and sends recommendations to governments. It develops and advocates for strong policies to protect against infringement And it promotes enforcement education. So some of its priority issues are custom and border measures, criminal enforcement, and online counterfeiting issues. So INTA's global anti-counterfeiting network also includes the various external stakeholders, which are industry, which can play a key role in helping governments better understand the practical implications of policy and legislative decisions, police, prosecutors, and the judiciary on the enforcement front, intermediaries and online marketplaces, investigators hired by brand owners to identify counterfeiters and to collaborate with police, and finally, legislators working to strengthen anti-counterfeiting laws and empower enforcement officials. But we can't only address supply. You have to also address demand. So we need to help consumers understand the negative impact of counterfeit goods and the positive role of IP in society. See, all these things kind of work together. So addressing demand is also an opportunity to strengthen consumer trust and protection, counter anti-IP sentiment, enhance brand equity, and persuade consumers to buy genuine products. 
INTA's primary focus is and has been on the younger generations who are still forming their shopping habits. So I I don't know if you're familiar with INTA's Unreal campaign, um, but it's 10 years old. It celebrated its 10-year anniversary last year, so I guess it's almost 11 years old, and it focuses on educating young consumers. It's a committee-led consumer awareness initiative that educates young consumers on the value of trademarks and brands and the danger of counterfeit goods. Uh, and it uses tools that young people will hopefully recognize, identify with, align with. I've seen some videos that they've done, and they all are very much geared toward uh, younger adults and teens. So uh, it, it, to date, in the last 10 years, we've done 487 presentations, both virtual and in person, in 47 different jurisdictions, and we've impacted we, I haven't done it. The Unreal campaign, and it's many, many volunteers globally have done it. They've uh, reached over 68,000 young adults to date, and thousands more than that that are un- uncountable at this point have been engaged through the social media outreach efforts. Okay, so uh, I think anti-counterfeiting becomes more and more important uh, because also because of the also all the online platforms and, as you mentioned, the shopping behavior of the younger people. Uh, because they are just going to, let's say, Alibaba or other platforms where there are, uh, where we know that there are a lot of counterfeit products uh, offered, and um, then they see, let's say, a Gucci bag for twenty dollars, and then, oh wow, this looks really cheap and nice. Uh, let's buy this one, and they don't really know that they support uh, big criminal organizations like organized crime behind behind these uh, counterfeit goods, they don't realize that the, the consumers shopping counterfeit goods, um, they don't really realize that they are supporting um, large organized crimes, uh, crime organizations um, with their behavior. Absolutely, a, a large organized crime, maybe child labor, all kinds of terrible things. And, you know, right. a Gucci purse, I gotta tell you, if it's $20, it's not a Gucci purse. Right, um, everyone knows. But- And so people think, well, what's the harm? It's just a purse. It's not counterfeit brake pads, which if they're wrong, if they're bad, they could make my car fail and I could cause an accident. It's just a purse. But they don't see that behind that purse, there is all these other things, organized crime, child labor, all kinds of other things, dilution of the brand, which they may not care as much about, but it is an important thing. And so anti-counterfeiting really is important. And the Unreal campaign specifically, I saw this one video where they were talking about this guy bought a, a counterfeit, I don't know what brand it was. It was it was a, a counterfeit purse for his girlfriend. And she was so excited because it was this really name brand purse. It was super expensive, right? And he paid, what, $20 for it. And of course, it fell apart shortly thereafter, and it was really crummy, and it ended up causing her embarrassment. And they tried to touch on some of the issues that young people would be really uh, concerned about, but also, where did this come from, and how was it made? And it's not just this counterfeit purse that you see being sold on a street corner or online and an online platform, that there's this whole network of evil behind it. And right. I think the Unreal campaign has been really successful in trying to raise awareness of those issues. Yes. Um, one other topic that I wanted to talk with you about, and we, we don't have so much time, so I have to crank all these topics that I want to talk with you about uh, in this short time. But uh, let's uh, move to the next topic because uh, that's also an important one. Um, it's about internet governance and the domain name system. So how do we deal with domain names in the future? And uh, Wow, yeah, if you, if you know, <laughs> if, you have an, if you have the solution, there's people all around the world that would hang on your every word because this, this is a big <laughs> struggle. Uh, but INTA has had a longstanding interest in internet governments and the administration of domain names, as you probably know. So INTA founded the Intellectual Property Constituency, or the IPC, of the Internet Corporation of Assigned Names and Numbers, of course, which is ICANN, um, back in 20. 20- 2002, rather. Uh, INTA's current senior senior director of internet policy is the current IPC president. That's Lori Shulman. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she's pretty great and she's very involved in all of these things. Uh, So INTA's priorities for the 2023 domain space are, of course, improving the rate of successful requests for domain name registration information by working with ICANN to facilitate balanced approaches to how domain information is collected, managed, and accessed given the current trends in global privacy laws. So 
public access to this data, which known as WHOIS, or at least used to be known as WHOIS, uh, has been severely limited, as you know, since the implementation of the EU's um, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, in May of 2018. And it's protected against uh, privacy concerns for, on the one hand, but on the other hand, and it's, and it's protected against illegitimate uh, phishing attempts at pri- to invade privacy. But what it's also done is it's just sort of killed any um, ability to find information for legitimate purposes. If I am in a coexistence agreement with a company that allows them to do certain things in certain terms, and I see this domain name registered, but I don't know to whom, there may or may not be a website up and running yet. Do I send a cease and desist letter? If I do so, am, am, am I actually breaching a, an agreement that someone we've agreed to coexist with, but I don't know who they are? So, I mean, there are some legitimate uses for it, and I could I have lists of them uh, that I've written down at some point, but it's a balance, right? It's a balance between protecting privacy and making sure that business can function smoothly on the other. And I am not an expert on this. If I could figure it out, I would make lots and lots of money, I'm sure. Uh, But I know that really dedicated people have been working on this for a long time. I am confident that they will come up with a solution that will be better. Who is is never coming back the way that it was? We are never going to be able to just enter yeah. one little thing and and here's all your information it's like oh, oh that's me. there it is <laughs> never coming back folks but okay. something more than we have now with mm-hmm. certain restrictions may be able to be uh developed and implemented and so that's i think what all of our all of our hope is so ant is there to advocate for recognition of ip rights holders as legitimate access seekers for domain registration information under the eu's uh, recently adopted cybersecurity law to be enacted by the 27 member states and so there's a push for implementation of recommendations from various ICANN reviews. It's been six years since a recommendation has been implemented in critical areas such as rights protection mechanisms, consumer choice, trust and competition, transparency and accountability, and that's just to name a few. So we're looking to deprioritize any more reviews until the backlog is cleared and ensure that no new rounds of applications are open until significant progress is made on access to domain name registration and mitigating domain name abuse. Okay. So um, uh, then we talked about um, domain names now, but I also want to briefly touch on uh, the future um with you so maybe we briefly also talk about things like nfts the metaverse and you brought up even topics like ip in space what does that mean <laughs> like what what do you mean about ip in space INTA has had uh, a number of reports that have issued. There was a group that looked at IP in space, and they recently released an, a, a report because there's the need. It, it seems like space travel is so far in the future, but the need is there now. And so they're already starting to look at how do we protect these things. And so there's you know more. I'm not an expert in it, but there's much more information available in the report, which is very interesting. And I, um, and because I sit on the board, I was lucky enough to hear uh, a couple of their presentations in person fascinating uh, stuff. There's also the IPO of the future report and toolkit. So I don't know if you want me to touch on that a little bit, but it's basically how we're transitioning from the trademark practitioner practitioner to brand professionals or brand counsel. So if I could just touch on that a little bit, it's something that I'm yeah. kind of excited about because yeah, it's yeah. touched me in my job as yeah, well. Yeah. So it's we're talking about how IP practitioners really need to evolve beyond their traditional roles. We are still oh. trademark lawyers, but Being a trademark lawyer now is broader than being a trademark lawyer used to be. So there's a shift a little bit, at least, from specialist to generalist. The expanded brand counsel role includes broader substantive skills, more dynamic skills. And in concert with that, INTA is broadening its scope to beyond traditional IP matters and increasingly engaging in matters of global importance. So through non-traditional IP issues, they still have an impact on on IP and various stakeholders within the IP ecosystem. And the opposite side is also true. Intellectual property also has an impact impact on these issues. So broadly speaking, the expanded COPE encompasses specific societal issues such as CSR, ESG, 
DEI. It's like alphabet soup. But all these things are becoming bigger and bigger parts of our, our practice, and they affect IP. So by expanding our scope, we are showing expertise and leadership on broader social issues. And it's opening doors for INTA. We're getting a seat at the table outside of the IP bubble. We're interfacing with new stakeholders on issues that surround intellectual property, issues that affect brands and that brands affect both positively and negatively. And in doing so, we're connecting the dots and showing why IP matters in this new context and in relation to these issues of global importance. Okay. So you are prepared for the future as well. I see. No, we're That's trying. Good. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So um, I want to spend the last minutes uh, advertising the annual meeting. Um, tell our listeners where will it be and when will it be. And I already booked my flight and my my okay. I registered already. So of course, <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. But um, maybe you tell us the basic facts first, and then we talk about the great location. Or maybe maybe you can already. Talk about this. Well, I think we have to say the location now since you said you already booked your flights. It's in Singapore, everybody. We hope you all come. So I'm really excited and I'm I'm more than happy to talk about this topic because I'm I'm so excited. As some of you may remember, you especially I'm sure remember, we were supposed to go to Singapore in 2020. Yes. And then of course the world shut down. I had booked my flight and then uh, of course it was canceled. <laughs> right. So we were last in Asia in 2014, as I uh, think you may have mentioned earlier when we were in Hong Kong. And then we were going to go back in 2020 and we were super excited about it. And then the global pandemic happened. So uh, that I don't want to say that it canceled. I want to say it was postponed. It was postponed to 2022. We are going back to Singapore. Finally, we're going to Singapore. Finally, uh, rebooked from 2020. Uh, it's obviously the annual meeting for INTA. It's the Global IP Community's premier event of the year. We're incredibly excited to make our way to Singapore. You know, it was an abrupt pivot in 2020 to virtual only. And then we were virtual only, I think, for a couple of years. And then back in person in D.C., I believe, last year. I maybe if I get some of this wrong, I'm hoping my colleagues will step in who <laughs> may be listening. But anyway, very excited to go to Singapore. We are expecting over 7,000 registrants to be there, including from major brands, government officials, and more. Uh, Asia is an extremely IP-intensive region. Uh, 70% of all patents filed come from that region. And the annual meeting, it's going to be in a, what we're calling a live plus format. So we're having the in-person event in Singapore in May. Uh, it's at the Sands Exposition Center, which is adjacent to the Marina Bay Sands Hotel. Super excited. I've, I've been there. I've seen the venue. It's fantastic. So we're doing the in-person event in May, and then we're doing the virtual event following it in June. I think for some meetings in the past, we tried to do the virtual and the in-person event at the same time. Much too hard. You can't be two places, even virtual places at once. Too hard on the planners, too hard on the attendees. So this way we're able to focus on one and then focus on the other. I believe, and I don't have that information in front of me, that once you've registered for the annual meeting, it's only 50 more dollars to register for the virtual event as well, which won't take place until June. So you'll have time then and you can interact with people through networking in person in Singapore and then online in June at the virtual event. Uh, the virtual event is going to include new sessions and some of the recorded in-person sessions. Um, so you can register for both with just that small price differential, and then you can engage in the networking and the new business building that in-person provides. It can never get better than in-person, as we talked about before, uh, and then maybe focus on education during the virtual event. It's going to be a two-track programming uh, around the theme, the business of innovation. So the first track is the IP slash innovation track, and it's going to cover the traditional IP topics and issues registrants usually expect from the INTA annual meeting. So this will include trademarks, brands, trade secrets, and more, as well as some patents and with an additional focus on future trends, as you mentioned. Uh, and then there's the second track is the business track, and that will cover topics such as the economics of brands, IP valuation, ideas to assets. IP is a financing tool and cooperation between public and private sectors to support entrepreneurship, plus keynote speeches on SME success stories. So there's going to be a terrific amount of business development opportunities as well, including, of course, committee meetings, some excursions, table topics, speed networking, 
more than 10 different social receptions, opportunities to meet with council from the Asia Pacific region, and, and this is what I'm really excited about, the grand finale on Saturday will be held at Universal Studios. Oh, yeah. So Universal Great. Studios Singapore. And it just sounds like so much fun. And as, as you know, and your listeners know, from attending annual meetings by the end, it's a it's an intense few days, and you're yeah. always ready for a big party at the end. Yes. So. I'm a really big roller coaster fan, so I'm <laughs> looking forward to it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. Very good. So, so, you know, we want to tell you that registration has been great. We talked a little bit before this started that, you know, the minute I say it, it's already outdated. But I can tell you that total registrants as of the date of recording this, which is the middle of February, were uh, 4,118. And good. we would anticipate certainly 7,000 or more um, okay. by the time that the can, that the annual meeting actually happens. Uh, but we will get you updated numbers as we go, and hopefully you can put them on your website or something, because yes. th- we're really excited about that number today. Uh, it's put us at or well ahead of where we had hoped to be at this point, but it's, we're hoping it's going to be actually a low m- number by the time where we are when this airs. So, um yeah. We'll get you the current numbers. I can only recommend to everyone in the IP field to register for this meeting. Uh, if they are trademark professionals or not, uh, even different fields of IP, because everyone is coming there. Uh, typically, like uh, I used to be at meetings where like 10,000 people gather right. from all over the world, like from all different kinds of trades of IP. And uh, so always very exciting people to meet there. You mentioned that you also have some keynote speakers and some highlights. Uh, right. Um, some you already told me, like like your Rotary International President Jennifer yes. Jones will be speaking at the keynote. Uh, she will be keynoting the opening, right? So, right, during the opening ceremonies, and I wrote down when this is going to be because I can never remember. So the opening ceremonies on Wednesday... May 17th from 4.30 to 6. She will not be speaking for an hour and a half, I promise you. But there will be a number of speeches during that time. And Rotary International's first ever female president, Jennifer Jones, is going to be speaking. So Rotary was founded in 1905. And after 118 years, we have a female president. It's We're super excited. She's Canadian. Uh, and she is a dynamic speaker. And I... I was really nervous to ask her if she would do it, and I couldn't believe it when she said yes. And I am so excited that she's going to, you know, the year that you're Rotary International President, you just travel and travel and travel. And the fact that she could make time for this shows that she sees the Rotary brand as really important. Jennifer Jones chaired Rotary's brand committee in uh, 2012, 2013, when we did the first brand refresh of our logo after 90 years. So she gets it. She will be able to talk about all kinds of different issues, including being a female entrepreneur. And I, I'm excited to hear her speak and I hope everybody comes to the open ceremonies. Um, we have a number of other great keynote speakers. Uh, I believe, I don't know what I'm allowed to say. Maybe you'll edit it out if I'm not allowed to say, but I think Daryl Tang is going to be speaking at one point. He's head of WIPO. And I believe one of our capsule keynote speakers is uh, Director Kathy Vidal. Kathy Vidal is director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, the USPTO. uh, And both Jennifer and uh, Director Vidal will be speaking at the Women's Leadership Initiative uh, the following day on Thursday, May 18th. And that's from 2 to 5 p.m. So we're really excited about those. And those are just a few highlights. I mean, I think it's going to be a great convention. Wow. Obviously, I'm biased, but I'm very excited. I'm also biased, but I'm also excited. <laughs> yeah, I will enjoy that very much. So, yeah, I'm very grateful that uh, that I had the time to speak with me about uh, your year um, as uh, president of uh, INTA and also the annual meeting. Um, and... Yes, to give us uh, like a forecast what we can expect as uh, participants of the meeting. Like, I'm really looking forward to the to the finale in the Universal Studios. <laughs> so that will be my personal highlight. I'm 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 still a little child sometimes inside. <laughs> I think we all are. That's why we have events like this at Universal Studios, right? <laughs> but of course, I'm also looking forward to the to your speech at the opening and to the speech of Jennifer Jones. Uh, so. And all the other interesting people there, I, I meet there. And uh, that's maybe the most important thing that you get to meet all the people that you work with worldwide in person. And that's so exciting. So 
So thank you so much for your time uh, and for uh, promoting the INTA annual meeting um, so we can meet more interesting people there. So um, yes, listeners, please register for the annual meeting. That is really important for your personal career, for fun and for making friends in the IP community worldwide. So yes. thank you so much for the promotion and thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed being able to chat with you. Thank you very much for being on the show, Jo Marie. That's it for this episode. If you liked what you heard, please show us your love by visiting ipfridays.com slash love and tweet a link to this show. We would be so grateful if you would do that. It would help us out to get the word out. Also, please subscribe to our podcast at ipfridays.com or on iTunes or Stitcher.com. If you have a question or want to be featured in one of the upcoming episodes, please send us your feedback at ipfridays.com slash feedback. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes. You can go to ipfridays.com slash iTunes, and it will take you right to the correct page on iTunes. If you want to get mentioned on this podcast or even have comments within the next episode, please leave us your voicemail at ipfridays.com slash voicemail. You have been listening to an episode of IP Fridays. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of nor are they endorsed by their respective law firms. None of the content should be considered legal advice. The IP Fridays podcast should not be construed as legal advice or legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only, and you are urged to consult your own lawyer on any specific legal questions. As always, consult a lawyer or patent or trademark attorney. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved.